Hey everybody, welcome to the third lecture video for Unit 9 on global change. Today we're going to continue discussing um, how the globe is changing, how humans are impacting the changing globe, and we're going to do that by looking at the oceans. We've already talked about the hole in the ozone layer, we've talked about global climate change, um, and we actually talked about sea level rise, we've hinted at the oceans, but now we're going to dive in. <laughs> Get it? Because it's, because, um, because you, di you dive into the water and it's, Anyway, so one of the biggest problems, there's two main problems facing, facing the oceans right now is ocean warming and ocean acidification. Ocean warming, if you take a look at this graph on the x-axis, we've got time, years, and on the y-axis, we've got the anomaly in temperature in Celsius, meaning that uh, it is hotter or colder than usual compared to the average. So an anomaly is something abnormally warm, for example. And you can see that the general trend is upward, is that since the 1850s, the ocean has been getting substantially warmer, and we're seeing more and more sea temperature anomalies where it's warmer than it usually is or warmer than the last average over the hundred uh, the average over the past hundred years um, and this is caused by the increase in greenhouse gases that I mentioned in the last ad puzzle leaning to global warming uh, and it's going to lead to habitat loss as coastal ecosystems get destroyed uh, people and animals and organisms are going to be forced to migrate but that also applies to marine ecosystems as well um, intertidal habitats or habitats that are on the coast like mangroves are going to get flooded um, and they will uh, either have to adapt move or die uh, and it can lead to a wide variety of issues or changes within organisms in marine ecosystems. Uh, they could be developmental in terms of how they grow, hormonal changes, changes in their reproductivity, um, metabolic changes, or, uh, you know, all because it, it, temperature can, if it's outside the range of ecological tolerance, can suppress physiological function, metabolic rate, etc. Um, and in terms of some of the things we we're talking about the last Ed puzzle, as the ocean warms, it's going to lead to food insecurity. A lot of the population of the Earth for humans gets their food from the ocean. Uh, we'll see more extreme weather events because a lot of storms get their energy from the ocean, a loss of coastal protection, and the increased spread of disease. Um, and one example of how ocean warming is affecting organisms in the ocean uh, is that many benthic organisms that, like mussels or crabs or whatever, they spawn larvae, um, and they, their larvae spawn depending on the temperature. And because the ocean is warming, they uh, are, are spawning their larvae much, much earlier in the year when the ocean currents are different. So those ocean currents are, are taking the larvae to the wrong locations, because they're in the wrong ocean currents for that time of year, and they're, the larvae are ending up deposited into um, areas that they can't survive in due to how warm it is or how abnormally cool it is. Um, if they were spawned at the right time of year, they would have got carried by a different ocean current to a place that they are more adapted to. Um, and one of the biggest uh, animals being impacted by ocean warming are corals. Uh, yes, corals are animals. Uh, and corals are super duper important because they're, they're what we call foundation species. They generate habitat, they generate structure for organisms to live in. Many fish and all sorts of things live within the coral reefs. They build the ecosystem. They are the ecosystem. If you take them out, there is no ecosystem left, right? They are the foundation of a coral reef ecosystem. It's in the name for Pete's sake. Um, they provide a wide variety of ecosystem services too. This includes tourism, medicine, food, education, storm protection, um, inspiration for the next Disney Pixar movie, you know, you name it. Um, and they're worth about $3.4 billion in the U.S. per year. Now, that's how much money they provide from uh, storm protection or um, tourism or uh, income and food from the fish themselves. So <clears throat> there's a lot of reasons to protect uh, coral reefs even if we're just looking at ourselves and, and the money as opposed to sort of stewardship of the earth. And as a result of this, the fact that they're foundation species means that they can be used to kind of indicate the health of the ocean, um, kind of like an indicator species, I suppose. And unfortunately, they're experiencing massive die-offs globally. A lot of this has to do with coral bleaching, which is oftentimes due to the warming of the ocean that I was just talking about, and ocean acidification. I'm going to take you through both of those processes. Um, currently, half of the world's coral reefs are gone already. Uh, alarms are going off within scientific communities about the, uh, the rate at which corals are dying, and it is projected that depending on how bad climate change is, 70 to 90 percent of the remaining corals will also be lost, both due to ocean warming and uh, ocean acidification. <clears throat> 
Um, so we need to do what we can to keep this number as low as possible. Um, and the first issue that corals are facing is coral bleaching. Coral are an animal that have a symbiotic relationship with algae inside them. And when the temperature gets too warm, the algae living inside that coral will die because it's outside of their ecological tolerance. And that um, causes the coral to lose its color. And uh, as I'll explain in a minute, uh, the coral loses its food source and starts to die. So coral anatomy, corals are animals, like I said. There are these little polyps. They live in big colonies, and they secrete calcium bicarbonate, uh, which is basically... Um, basically like bone, to create the skeleton. They deposit it around them and they build up this hard shell which they live upon. The shell itself is not living, but the little polyps on the outside, those, these are the corals and these are what's living. <clears throat> Inside of the cells of these corals are phytoplankton or algae, or as they're called here, zooxanthellae. They're tiny microscopic photosynthesizers. Um, you can refer to them as algae, um, but the, the term they generally use in relation to coral is zooxanthellae, which you can see here. It's kind of a funky word, but it's kind of fun. Um, and so these two have a symbiotic relationship. The zooxanthellae are providing food and energy to the corals. By doing photosynthesis, the energy they create from doing that, they're sharing with the coral. Meanwhile, the coral is providing the zooxanthellae with a place to live. So it's a mutualistic relationship. Here's a picture. You can see here's a polyp of a coral. And you can see all the little zooxanthellae inside there. Now, when it gets too hot, the zooxanthellae can't survive. It's outside their ecological tolerance, and so they die. And so the coral suddenly don't have a source of energy, and so the coral are going to struggle as well. Now, coral can bounce back from this, but it's not a sure thing. Um, and eventually, if they die completely, the algae are what gives the coral its color, uh, which is why they call it coral bleaching, because when the algae die, the coral turn white. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty, but when you realize that it's because they're all dead, um, it's, it's kind of a tough pill to swallow. <clears throat> uh, and it's, it's really, really important that we don't let this happen as much as we can because, like I said, corals are a very complex ecosystem and they form the foundation of it. So if the corals are gone, the whole ecosystem collapses, um, ceases to exist, um, and there's probably not a great chance of recovery. The coral food web is very, very complex. So what, what, what can we do to help curb this? Like I said, we want to focus on the 10 to 30% of corals that will survive. Uh, we can breed them to be more resistant to heat. We can genetically manipulate them. We can replant them or transplant them in different areas. We are making progress in this department and finding corals that are able to withstand high heat. Um, a great example is this study here, uh, which came out about uh, December 8, 2020. Uh, discovering that some corals are actually not only able to survive heat waves, but actually able to recover during the heat waves, during long heat waves. Um, this was done in uh, Kiribati, which is over um, north of New Zealand, over in the uh, Pacific, <clears throat> looking at coral reefs there. And uh, this is a pretty fascinating study. So they explain that there are, there are two types of algae that are generally found in corals in this area, two types of zooxanthellae. Uh, one of them are heat, one of the algae tends to be heat sensitive and one of them tends to be heat resistant. And corals that live in areas near humans, uh, in areas with higher pollution, tended to have the heat resistant algae, whereas isolated corals that lived far away from humans in clearer, uh, healthier waters tended to have the heat-sensitive algae. And you would think that these heat-resistant algae would actually do better in terms of surviving from a heat wave, but that's not what they found, and it's, it's really interesting, their explanation. So there was a massive heat wave, and they found unusually that some corals were actually managed to survive and bounce back during the heat wave in this area. Um, and up until that point, we thought that corals could only survive shorter heat waves of a few weeks and then recovered afterwards, but this is new and, and optimistic. And uh, a quote from the article, corals that started out with the heat-sensitive algae actually had a higher survival rate, 82%, then coral that began with the heat-tolerant algae, 25%. And the authors hypothesized that the heat-sensitive algae, um, A, are, are really good at photosynthesizing and so actually provide the coral with more energy. So the coral had more energy to last through the heat wave, whereas the heat-resistant algae weren't as efficient as producing energy. Additionally, they hypothesized that because these heat-sensitive algae 
uh, and the corals they live in lived in isolated reefs that had low pollution, um, they hypothesized that their immune system and the general health of these corals was much higher because they lived in clearer waters, uh, suggesting that if we can reduce water pollution, we might actually increase the coral resilience to bleaching, uh, which is great news uh, and a really fascinating study. Okay, and the second major problem facing the oceans and corals in particular is ocean acidification. This is a decrease in the ocean pH. Remember that when pH goes down, uh, that is an increase in acidity. And this is due almost entirely due to the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, carbon dioxide is released from a lot of sources, um, and it is actually absorbed by the ocean. It is exchanged between the ocean and the atmosphere, and you can see while there is a lot in fossil fuels, uh, there's a lot in the air, and there's a ton in sedimentary rock, there's also a decent amount in oceans, relatively speaking. A lot of carbon dioxide is stored there, and much of that carbon dioxide is coming from the burning of fossil fuels from vehicle emissions, but also deforestation. All of this atmospheric CO2, the ocean absorbs about 30% of it. Uh, so there's a lot of CO2 being dissolved into the ocean. And um, this can impact the pH of the ocean. Now remember, pH scale is inverse. So a, or a low pH means high acidity. A high pH means high base um, alkalinity or, or low acidity. And the pH scale is logarithmic meaning that each difference is a power of 10. So a 3.0 is 10 times more acidic than a 4.0, and it's 100 times more acidic than a 5.0. So a 0.1 decrease in pH is re relative to a 30% increase in acidity. So this may not seem like a lot, but because the scale is logarithmic, it's actually quite substantial, which is what we're starting to see in the ocean right now. Because um, when, uh, as I'll explain in a minute, carbon dioxide can actually increase the acidity of the water. Currently, the ocean pH is about 8.1. You can see uh, this map here. Uh, the warmer the color, the closer to red, uh, the bigger the decrease in pH that we're seeing in those areas. Uh, and, and, and no areas are white where we're seeing no change. So all of the oceans are becoming more acidic all around the globe. It looks like it's worse up here towards England, Ireland, and Greenland. And it's expected to decrease to 7.8, which is a pretty, pretty substantial change in the pH. Uh, this is something we should be worried about keeping our eyes on. Um, and if you take a look at this graph, this is the Mauna Loa curve, which I've shown before. And you may have actually graphed it in class recently uh, with me. And on the x-axis, we've got year. On the y-axis, we've got the CO2 levels, parts per million in red here. Uh, and then in blue, we've got the uh, amount of CO2 dissolved into the seawater uh, near, so the carbon dioxide is being measured here on this main island of Hawaii, and they're looking at the water nearby, and you can see the concentration of carbon dioxide in the water is also increasing over time. And on the green, we've got the pH. We can see the pH is decreasing with time. So we see a direct correlation between the CO2, the CO2 dissolved in water, and the decrease in pH in the water. And, and the reason for that is because of some basic chemistry. When water reacts with carbon dioxide, it forms carbonic acid. And that's the very basic uh, uh, takeaway, right? There's acid being formed in the water that's increasing the acidity of the water. No, duh, right? Acid is acidic. Who would have thought? Um, and what this will do, this acid will actually react with a molecule called carbonate. Carbonate. Uh, calcium carbonate is what many marine organisms use to make their shells. And so this acid will actually start to uh, dissolve many of the corals and other organisms that rely on shells by uh, decreasing the amount of available calcium carbonate. So CO2 dissolves into the water, reacts with water to form carbonic acid, and that carbonic acid reacts with uh, carbonate, reduces the amount of free carbonate that is floating around, uh, so organisms that need carbonate to make their shells can't find it, right? So when organisms like mussels, scallops, clams, crabs, lobsters, starfish, etc., corals, when they combine carbonate with calcium, that makes their shell. And so uh, this is really problematic for them because not only does it mean it's harder for them to form new shells, that means it's harder for them to repair their shells and their shells might actually start to get broken down from the acid. Uh, here's another diagram showing the same thing. CO2 dissolves in water, reacts to form carbonic acid, which decreases the availability of carbonate ions. Again, the same thing here. CO2 plus water plus carbonate ions creates two bicarbonate ions. Organisms can't use this to make shells. And it leads to some pretty stark impacts. If you put a shell in acid, uh, you will see some substantial degradation of that shell over time. And this is something we'll actually do in class with an ocean acidification lab that will span many days. Uh, so prepare yourself.
Here's a video showing uh, what some shells can look like. It's a time lapse of shells being put in uh, vinegar. So take a look. You can see immediately the reaction with all the bubbles and the shells start to disintegrate. Um, I don't know how long this took. Probably a couple days, I would guess. It depends on how strong the acid is, frankly. Um, but you can see once they are exposed to the acid, we start to see this reaction. Um, you start to see the bubbles flying and the shells completely break down and disintegrate. So any organism that relies on a shell to survive, like scallops for protection or like coral, uh, is going to be completely broken down. Um, and there's a lot we can do though. Um, mainly, we need to focus on <laughs> reducing carbon dioxide uh, in the air. Um, some people are again breeding the corals to increase the resistance to acidity. Some organisms or some coral reefs near volcanoes have been found to be more resistant to o ocean warming and ocean acidification. Um, but mainly we need to focus on reducing our CO2 emissions, reducing climate change, planting carbon sinks like mangroves and forests, protecting ecosystems that exist to reduce the carbon, or <coughs> carbon concentration. And we need, to, uh, <laughs> we need to educate others. Apparently I need to educate myself on how to spell. Uh, we need to educate others because a lot of people know about CO2 and climate change. Most people don't really understand what's going on with ocean acidification. Um, so we need to make sure that uh, people are aware of this problem so that way it's just one more piece of evidence we can use to say, look, it's really important that we decrease our CO2 emissions. Uh, okay, that's all I got for you. I will see you in class to look at an ocean acidification lab. Bring your questions, and I will see you then.